I'm Vinnie Politan. We begin closing arguments tonight with huge breaking news. And this is what we suspected but was confirmed today. I want to show you some video. And this is a moment um, under normal circumstances your hearts would go out to the family. I, you know, people have mixed emotions. These are law enforcement showing up to the laundry home um, just moments before the official word was released via Twitter by the FBI. So you look at that scene, it, it's not a happy scene for anyone. And under normal circumstances, I think all of us would be feeling the same way. And I, and I understand there are mixed emotions out there, but at the end of the day, uh, these parents have been told the worst possible news. Their child is dead. But that child is Brian Laundrie. Brian Laundrie, we know the remains that were found yesterday in the search at the Carlton Reserve, really found because of the efforts of Brian Laundrie's own parents. And yes, the story has taken on a life of its own, um, but I think we all have to take just a moment just to, to, just to think about how his parents got in the position that they're in. And, and everything that has transpired since and, and where you want to place blame and where you want to point fingers, um, obviously it'll be different for different folks the, the way they see all of this. Uh, what we do know, though, is the official word from the FBI. Here's the news release that came out uh, just moments after uh, law enforcement was at the doorstep of the, of the laundry family. Um, they tweeted out on October 21st, 2021, a comparison of dental records confirmed that the human remains found at the T. Mabry Carlton Jr. Memorial Reserve and Mayakayahatchee Creek Environmental Park are those of Brian Laundry. Now, uh, we have a statement from the Laundry family attorney uh, who said that Chris and Roberta Laundry have been informed that the remains found yesterday in the reserve are indeed Brian's. We have no further comment at this time, and we ask that you respect the Laundry's privacy at this time. That coming from Stephen Bertolino. So let's just take a moment and think about the position uh, that those parents are in and, and where they've been placed in. And there have been comparisons to George and Cindy Anthony and, and other situations in high-profile cases. I've been saying this from the beginning. Uh, people... Um, angry because of the silence. And, and it wasn't about protecting their son. It was the silence in not letting Gabby's parents know that Gabby did not come home with Brian. Not telling them that their daughter was somewhere out west and what they knew or didn't know, I, I, can't, I don't know. I mean, common sense tells me they knew something really bad happened. That's why they got a lawyer. But to not have the decency to pick up the phone and let the parents know something terrible has happened mm. and have that mm. conversation parent to parent, that's where the anger started against um, Brian Laundrie's parents in this case. And that's why people may not be feeling the sympathy we would normally feel when a parent um, has law enforcement knock on their door and say, yeah, we have positively identified the remains of your child. Now, more importantly, uh, we reached out to Gabby Petito's family. They're not making any statements at this time, and, and I can't imagine what this day is like for them. Um, they are still mourning the loss of Gabby. Um, they were angry that uh, Brian had not given himself up. Now they perhaps know why, although we don't know exactly when he passed away, when he took his own life, when he was killed, whatever happened to him out there. That hasn't been determined what happened or when it happened. But... Uh, for Gabby's parents, um, this, is, this is not an easy night for them. This is a difficult night for them. But I, I hope that they take away from it that they won't have to go through what families of murder victims have to go through when the murderer is caught, pleads not guilty, and goes to trial. There's an unknown ending. Sometimes questions are answered but there's no guarantee of a result. They won't have to go through any of that. And that's, that's, a, that's a blessing. But it also comes with maybe not all the answers they want, but hopefully those answers will come through the FBI investigation and Northport uh, Police and everyone else involved can um, help them understand what they can understand uh, as to what happened to their daughter, Gabby. 
Um, let's bring in our, our legal think tank tonight, get some reaction. Uh, joining us tonight in the Bronx, New York, criminal defense attorney Renee Hill, in Houston, Texas, criminal defense attorney Carmen Rowe, and in Atlanta, Georgia, criminal defense attorney, law professor at Emory University, and Georgia Innocence Project board member Molly Palmer. Great to have everyone with us tonight. Um, Renee, I'll, I'll, I'll begin with you, because a lot of focus right now has been placed on Brian Laundrie's parents. And is it fair? Is it unfair? Your thoughts uh, right now as this breaking news just coming to light that, yes, those are the remains of Brian Laundrie that were recovered yesterday? You know, I, I think it's unfair in this case. I understand that everyone was angry with the parents because they believed they had information and they were not disclosing that information. You know, but I put it out there before when we talked about this case. As a parent, what would you do to protect your child? And I understand you're saying that they didn't speak up when he first came home uh, without Gabby, but we don't know, and at this point, we may never know what he actually said to his parents when he came home. We don't know if he said to them, you know what, she flew back home to her parents' house to see her parents, and then when it turns out that she was actually missing, a lawyer is not at that point going to let them say anything because if they had said at that point, well, he told us that she flew home, that would be a problem as well for, for Brian. So, you know, they were really in a catch-22 situation. And now for them to have the blame as if it could have changed anything, that's not going to help. And at the end of the day, they have lost a child as well. Now, the scenario you just laid out would be the one scenario where I think people would be, okay, um, Brian makes up a story, says they had a fight, and she went home to her parents. Maybe at that point, Brian Laundrie's parents wouldn't want to reach out to them because things are kind of dicey between the kids. Um, Carmen, your thoughts tonight? I think that's the only scenario um, where they could... Per, and come forward and say it, right? I mean, but they haven't said anything, Carmen. What are, what are your thoughts? What, what does the family do here? Um, do they still remain silent? Is there still any potential legal liability they have to worry about? What exact, where are we in all this regarding the parents? Because they're the only two left here because Brian Laundrie is gone. Yeah, Vinny, I mean, if you believe that most of our audience is upset because Brian and his family didn't come forward and tell the victim's family what was going on, it's got to get worse now. Because most people believe, as I believe, that Brian Laundry came back, he told his family what happened likely in the last moments of her life and that he may have that information and isn't going to share it and that this victim's family will never ever know those details. And so that is something that everybody's going to be wondering what happens next. But look, this family's liability is very real regarding not making statements, but making statements that are false to police. And in Florida, that's an offense. And so they could be charged if they give false or misleading information to law enforcement officers that they know is true. What's really interesting, or no, is false, excuse me, What's in really interesting about this case and charges coming for the family is that a lot of people believe they may have been an accessory after the fact, that they assisted their son in fleeing, hiding, and whatever else we find out occurred. But what's interesting is that unless and until uh, Brian Laundrie is charged with a first or second degree felony charge, in this case, they can't be charged. So it's going to be interesting to see whether law enforcement actually charges him after the fact with the, this murder, whether or not the parents get charged. But I think everybody believes that there's liability here for the parents, unfortunately, in helping to protect their son under these circumstances. Molly Palmer, how do you see this very, very unique and complicated uh, situation, absolutely heart-wrenching for Gabby Petito's uh, family, um, for Brian Laundrie's family, it seems like they knew more than they were saying. Um, and, and at this point, uh, less sympathy for them for many reasons. Um, but it seems like they were prepared, much more prepared for this than anyone else. I mean, were they prepared or not? Is anyone prepared to suffer through the death of a child? I, I just don't think so. I think this is one of those situations. And those of us that do criminal defense, you know, Unfortunately, murder suicides are not that rare. You know, this happens. 
And I think some of us suspected this is exactly what would happen in this case. And I think when tragedy begets tragedy, there comes a point where you have to have a little empathy for those that are suffering through it, whether or not you believe they had some knowledge of what happened. I think the extent of knowledge is also kind of relevant here. Do we really believe that Brian Laundrie confessed every little detail of what happened and then went into this, you know, swampland in Florida? Likely not, you know, but at the end of the day, I do have empathy not only for Gabby Petito's family, but also for this family because both of them have lost a child to an unspeakable, horrific tragedy. Okay, well, we're getting a little bit of insight into perhaps what the Laundries knew, didn't know, why they did what they did, because Steve and Bertolino, their attorney, spoke with Chris Cuomo. Uh, and again, this is before Brian's um, body was positively identified, but talked about a lot of the things involving why they went to that area, why they were so quickly able to find his stuff while investigators like the FBI have been looking for a month. Let's take a listen. Why did the parents choose today to go to the preserve? Well, it is my understanding that the preserve was only open to the public as of yesterday. So my clients reached out to me and informed me that they wanted to go into to the preserve this morning. And I thought it would be wise to notify law enforcement of their intentions. I did so by text to my contact in the Northport Police Department. And they responded with, uh, thank you for the heads up. And then they met my clients there this morning. So fortunately, uh, one of your um, rival news people were there with a camera. And I say fortunately because, you know, some people don't believe how the events laid out today. Um, but Chris and Roberta walked into the preserve. It is my understanding that they were followed closely by the two law enforcement personnel. And when I say closely, certainly with an eye shot. And as they went further in, Chris ventured off the trail into the woods. He was zigzagging in different areas. Law enforcement was doing the same thing. And Roberta Laundry was walking down the trail. And I believe that is on some video to some other news outlet. At some point, Chris locates what's called a dry bag. The dry bag is a white bag is laying in the woods, I'll say 20 feet or so off the trail, According to Chris, it was in some, some bramble. Chris didn't want to pick the bag up because he wanted the law enforcement to see it. This was caught on camera. Chris couldn't find the law enforcement because they were then out of sight because Chris had been in the woods. So he didn't want to leave the bag there with the news reporter standing nearby. So he picked it up. He did meet up shortly with law enforcement. They looked at the contents of the bag. At that time, Law enforcement officers showed him a picture on the phone of a backpack that law enforcement had located also nearby and also some distance off the trail. At that point, the laundries were notified that there was also uh, remains near the backpack and they were asked to leave the preserve. What do you make of the suggestion that Mr. Laundry planted the bag and the backpack? In nice terms, it's hogwash. Um, would the authorities have known what they walked onto the trail with? Absolutely. They met them at the gate or somewhere nearby. They walked in with them. And more importantly, Chris, this is what I said. Fortunately for the laundries, the press was following them in the whole time. Why wouldn't the dogs have found these remains? You would have to ask ask the experts on that. that. That's not my expertise. If it was underwater, maybe the dogs couldn't, you know, detect the remains uh, underwater. Maybe the dogs were never brought back to that area. Um, I don't know. You'd have to ask someone else that question. Okay. Carmen Rowe, does this change the way you see anything uh, relative to the parents based upon what their attorney is saying? No. <laughs> That's their attorney. He's there to protect them and to say whatever he needs to say to protect them. 
But, you know, I think there's more questions than answers as usual with this story. But I think everybody wants to know why the family would walk onto the area where the body and where his materials were ultimately found. And everybody has a different theory about it. But to suggest that this was just some crazy coincidence after a month long search from law enforcement, I think is just unbelievable to most people. The thing that that uh, head scratcher Renee Hill is that the area seems to be very close to the entrance. It's not we're not deep into there. It would be like would be like the first place you would look. Um, yeah. The only reason I'm not that skeptical is is I go back and, and compare this to the case involving Kelly Marie Anthony, and her remains. Her remains were the, in the first wooded area as close as you could get to. Uh, to the Anthony's house, and it was never searched. They searched, so I, I could see it being possible that they didn't find it, but I, I'm, I'm still scratching my head. Right, but then also, Vinny, you know, as we're hearing that this area had been underwater for such a long period of time, or, or for at least a month, they're saying, or so, that it was underwater, and now that the water has recessed and they have access to this location again, you know, they could have washed up. It, it could have been that they were floating around somewhere. You know, it doesn't mean that the parents uh, planted this evidence in such a location. Molly Palmer, how important is, is it going to be for the medical examiner here to try to determine cause and manner of death for Brian Laundrie? You know, Vinny, we haven't heard anything about the possibility of a weapon, right? So so if they had found perhaps a gun at the scene and they haven't announced that, and that may be the case, well, then I think, you know, it's going to be fairly simple for the medical examiner to determine cause of death. But my understanding is that these are skeletal remains and possibly have been underwater, as Renee said, for months. And so it might be difficult if it's not something like a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Um, but I do, I do think everybody wants answers. And had this just been the dry bag or just the journal, that would be one thing. But trust me, it's really difficult to fake uh, a dental match or to fake the kind of exams that the ME is going to do in this case. And as much as I would like to point the finger at the FBI, I don't believe that they and the laundry's parents are in on this and kind of planting this evidence in this area. I agree with you there. Okay. Our think tank staying with us the whole hour. Um, when we come back, we're going to talk about the latest in the big trial that we're covering here on Court TV. Jury selection still underway in the case against these three men accused of murdering Ahmad Arbery. Uh, there's a lot of demonstrators outside of the courthouse, and we're going to talk about the impact of what's happening outside of the courthouse with what's happening inside. That's next.